Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you and we praise you for your word this morning. We receive it. We thank you for it written in our heart and mind. Thank you for revelation that you're bringing forth in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated if you would. <clears throat> Today we're going to talk further on the subject of the Feast of the Lord. This is the time of the season of the fall feasts. And it's important for us to understand about what they are talking about. And we've talked about the fall feasts of trumpets. We talked about Day of Atonement. And we've talked about the Feast of Tabernacles. Today we're going to talk about the personal fulfillment of the Feast of the Lord in your life, which is important to understand. First of all, Levit Leviticus 23, verse 2. Speak unto the children of Israel and say unto them concerning the feasts of the Lord, which you shall proclaim to be holy convocations, these are my feasts. They're not Old Testament feasts. They're not Jewish feasts. They're God's feasts. Verse 4. These are the feasts of the Lord, even holy convocations or assemblies, which you shall proclaim in their seasons. This is the season, so we're proclaiming them. Do we look at them just from a historical standpoint? No, because there's a prophetic aspect of them. Who is the one who fulfills them all? Jesus. And there's also an experiential aspect of fulfillment in our life. Many people have not understood that because it brings forth the revelation of the work of God through Jesus Christ in your life and my life to bring us to the place of perfection and to fulfill that mighty work that he's going to accomplish to bring forth the glorious church. <coughs> of these feasts, there are seven feasts. Passover, unleavened bread, first fruits. That's the first feast season in the first Hebrew month. The next one is, is Pentecost, which is in the third Hebrew month. And then the last three are trumpets, Day of Atonement, and Feast of Tabernacles. They have historical fulfillment, but the historical fulfillment is all pointing towards the types and shadows that are shown forth that are pointing towards the real fulfiller of them, who is Jesus. Jesus is the fulfillment of these feasts of the Lord. Passover lamb. Jesus was the one who died on that very day taking our sins. Unleavened bread. He bore away the sins in hell for three days and three nights, paying the price during that time. After he was born from the dead, came up and got his body, went up to heaven, he fulfilled the feast of first fruits, presenting himself as the first fruit, has been raised from the dead, born from the dead. And so he fulfilled that on the very day of the feast of first fruits. And then we see Pentecost 50 days later, the very day of Pentecost. The Holy Spirit was poured out, which is the birthday of the church, the beginning of people who are alive being born again. He fulfilled those four on the exact day. And the last three will be fulfilled on the last day, uh, on the, in the second coming of Jesus, on the exact days. Trumpets is talking about the catching up of the church to meet the Lord in the air, the rapture. Day of Atonement. Day of Atonement is the time of the judgment that's going to come upon the nations. And then tabernacles is the millennial reign of Jesus Christ that will begin for a thousand years. Now these things will come to pass as in his second coming, these last three fulfillments. But also we must understand there is a personal fulfillment of the Feast of the Lord in our life because it presents the gospel and the work of God in our life. We're going to talk about that today in Exodus chapter 12. Exodus chapter 12 and verse 5. They were to take a lamb, and they were to bring this lamb. It said, your lamb shall be without blemish. A male of the first year, you shall take it out from the sheep or from the goats. And you shall keep it until the 14th day of the same month. And the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening, which really means between the evenings in the Hebrew. as the very day that Jesus died on the cross, the 14th day of the first Hebrew month. And you shall take of the blood and strike it on the two side posts and the upper door posts of the houses wherein they shall eat it. And they shall eat the flesh in that night, roast with fire and unleavened bread, and with bitter herbs they shall eat it. Notice that they were to eat this lamb. What is that all talking about? 
if I eat something, I take something within me. Who is the lamb fulfillment? Jesus. What is the personal fulfillment? It's you taking Jesus within you. How do you take Jesus within you? When you receive him as your personal Lord and Savior and be born again. The beginning personal fulfillment of the Feast of the Lord is Passover, which speaks of you and I eating or taking Jesus into us and being born again. John 1.12, as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. When you received Jesus, he, you took him on the inside of you. And over in John chapter 3, we see in verse 5, it says, John said, Verily, verily, I say unto except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Born of water is physical birth. Born of spirit is spiritual birth. We know that in the next verse. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, physical birth. That which is born of the spirit is spirit, spiritual birth. And that's why I said, marvel not that I said unto you, you must be born again. Unfortunately, the King James translated it again, which is not a good translation. It means literally from above. You and I, are not born again like we're reborn physically. Some people even call it that. The world doesn't even understand it out there. It's born from above. It's a spiritual birth that everybody has to have. When you receive Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, you experience a personal birth. And what happens? You're changed on the inside of you because just as you took, they ate the lamb and took him inside, what happens? Jesus comes into us. How does he come into us? Through the Spirit of Jesus Christ. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. You're brand new on the inside of you. What do you get? You get a new spirit, the Spirit of Jesus Christ. Old things are passed away, all things have become new. Where? In your spirit. Not in your soul, not in your body. And what kind of a spirit did you get? Galatians? Chapter 4, verse 6 says, Because your sons God has sent forth the Spirit of His Son into your hearts. You and I have the Spirit of Jesus Christ. That is the new Spirit that you and I have on the inside of us. Now, after they had been told to eat the lamb, we see in Exodus chapter 12, we come down to verse 11. And he said, Thus shall you eat it with your loins girded, your shoes on your feet, your staff in your hand. You shall eat it in haste. It's the Lord's Passover. What were they going to do? They were going to get ready to leave Egypt. Once they had eaten the, eaten the lamb and the Passover where the, God's death angel came and destroyed all the firstborn of Egypt, but preserved those who had eaten the lamb, then we see it was now time for them to leave. They were to leave. They were, have their shoes on their feet. They are ready to leave. And that brings us to the next point. Exodus chapter 12 and verse 15. Seven days shall you eat unleavened bread. Even the first day you shall put away leaven out of your houses. For whosoever eateth leavened bread from the first day until the seventh day, that soul shall be cut off from Israel. From Israel. And then in verse 17, he says, And you shall observe the feast of unleavened bread, for in this selfsame day have I brought your armies out of the land of Egypt. Therefore shall you observe this day in your generations by an ordinance forever. What was supposed to happen? They were coming out of Egypt. They were going to leave Egypt. And how did they leave? They left, left through the Red Sea that parted. What does this all speak of? This now speaks of the next thing that needs to happen in our life. And going through the Red Sea, departing from Egypt, is all a type of water baptism. Water baptism does not wash away your sins. Water baptism shows forth that you have received Jesus as personal Lord and Savior. You've been born again. It shows forth now that you are in, come into covenant relationship with God. And it also shows that you've come into the priesthood. 
It is the answer of a good conscience before God. We see it in 1 Peter chapter 3, over in verse 20, 21. He says, which sometime were disobedient when once the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah while the ark was preparing, wherein few, that is, eight souls were saved by water. The like figure wherein to even baptism doth also now save us. What kind of a saving? Not the putting away of the filth of the flesh. Doesn't get rid of our sins. What did it do? It saved us out of the ways of the world because we have left the world. Because what were they leaving? They were leaving Egypt. Egypt in scripture is a type of the world. We are leaving the ways of the world. We're not walking in the ways of the world any longer because we're born from above. And now we're going to walk in the ways of heaven. But it's not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God. Leaving the world. And leaving the world as we... Water baptism just shows the fact also that you've come into the priesthood. You've come into a relationship now with God as a priest before him. And we can see that this was actually declared when John the Baptist spoke this. He was pointing out the change in the way that a person comes into the priesthood here. In Matthew chapter 3, verse 11, is when John the Baptist said, I indeed baptize you with water under repentance. Why was he baptizing them? Because that was the first step to come into the priesthood in the Old Testament. There were three things they had to do. There had to be the washing of water, the baptism. There had to be the anointing, oil, which is all type of the Holy Spirit. And there had to be the application of the blood on the tip of the right ear, the right thumb, and the great toe of the right foot, which is all talking about areas where we would sin with our hands or what we hear or our walk, talking about the blood that was to cleanse us. So this was all for them to be cleansed, to be priests in the Old Testament. Well, there's a change now in the way you come into the, old, into the priesthood. In the Old Testament, it was coming into a physical priesthood, but who could be a priest? Only the tribe of Levi, those that were born of the tribe of Levi. Well, there was a prophecy that was given. We'll come back to this in a moment. This prophecy was given in Exodus chapter 19 that all the Israelites knew about. Exodus 19, verse 5. Now, therefore, if you will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, you shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine. And you shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. They were going to, all of them were going to become a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Well, that was a prophecy that could not be fulfilled in the Old Testament era. Because only the those of the tribe of Levi could be priests in the Old Testament. Yet he says all of them are going to be a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Well, when it was going to be fulfilled? It was going to be fulfilled in the New Testament when everybody comes into the priesthood. And how do you get into the priesthood? We've well, got to be born into the priesthood. Well, how is that going to happen? Because in the Old Testament, only the tribe of Levi, only those could be priests. It's because the priesthood way in was going to change. That's what John the Baptist is speaking of in Matthew 3, verse 11. I baptize you with water under repentance. That's the way they came in in the Old Testament. But he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. This is now a spiritual baptism. And this spiritual baptism brings you into the priesthood, and also, as of course, is what happens when you get born again. We know this from 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 13, when it says, For by one Spirit are we all baptized into one body. By one Spirit. That's the Holy Spirit. We're baptized into the Holy Spirit. So, there's now a change. We don't go through... A, a baptism in the old, as the Old Testament to become a priest. It's now a spiritual baptism. 
when we receive Jesus, personal Lord and Savior, and we're born again, and now we come into the body of Christ, which is bringing us into the priesthood. And now you and I are priests before God, as well as kings. Revelation 1, 6, he has made us kings and priests unto God. Every one of us. You're born again, you're a king, and you're a priest unto God. That is the change now. And God wants you to take your rightful place as a priest and as a king. Another thing about the aspect of leaving Egypt, Egypt's a type of the world, for the personal fulfillment and application in your life is you got to leave the world. How do I leave the world? You do not walk according to the world's ways any longer. You are now walking according to heaven's ways. Romans chapter 12, verse 2. Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so you learn who you are in Christ and you learn God's ways and you walk according to heaven's ways. You and I are not to be conformed to this world or to this age it's speaking of where the enemy, Satan, has been the god of this age. He's been the ruler over this world because of the fall of man. Now, you and I are to come out of it because we're born from above. You're now a part of the true church. There's one church. It's the church of the firstborn. There is only one church that God recognizes, the church of the firstborn. And that's all the ones that have received Jesus as personal Lord and Savior. Can you and I walk in the ways of the world any longer? No. We cannot stay in Egypt. They had to leave Egypt. James chapter 4, verse 4. He said, you adulterers and adulteresses. An adulterer, adulteress is one who has spiritually separated themselves from another that they were in covenant with. Know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever there will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. God has delivered you out of this world, ruled by the enemy, and therefore we cannot be walking in the ways of the world any longer. If we are a friend of the world, we become an enemy of God. We don't walk after the ways of the world any longer. Well, what's wrong with the world, you say? 1 John chapter 2, verse 15. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. What's wrong with it? For all that's in the world, not some, all that's in the world... And how does it operate? The lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. That's how it operates. It's all out for me, me, me. It's not of the Father, but it's of the world. That's why you cannot walk according to the ways of the world. Verse 17, and the world passeth away, and the lust thereof. It's all going to pass away. But who's going to be able to remain? He that doeth the will of God is the one who abides forever. This is the one who's a continual doer of the word. When he put the cursor over the word doeth, it is a present tense verb, which in the Greek means continuous, repeated, ongoing action. The person who's the continual doer of the will of God is the one who's going to abide forever. Therefore, the personal application of Passover was receiving Jesus, getting born again, and the unleavened bread, remember, it was the beginning of unleavened bread, when they were to leave Egypt. That is the beginning of unleavened bread, which is coming out from that which is of the enemy of the world, dominated by Satan. So you and I are going to leave the world system. We're not going to walk according to it. How can I, what am I to walk by? God's word. God's word is spiritual law. And it is heaven's ways that you and I are going to follow after. Going back to Exodus chapter 12, look what he says further about unleavened bread. Seven days there shall be no leaven found in your houses. For whosoever eateth that which is leavened, even that soul shall be cut off from the congregation of Israel, whether he be a stranger or born in the land. Leaven is a type of sin. Eating unleavened is eating that which has not had any sin in it. God's word, of course, is unleavened. And now we are to eat God's word, get the word in us, and walk according to God's word. 
We are not to let any leaven come into us whatsoever. Verse 20, you shall eat nothing unleavened. Remember, eating is synonymous with taking something into you. You don't take anything into you that's, un that's leavened any longer, that's sin. In all your habitations, you shall eat unleavened bread. Eating, spirit, talking about type for us, is taking something on the inside of us, whatever you let come into you. God only wants us to take into us that which is holy, that is righteous. He does not want us to take anything in us that is sinful in our life whatsoever. Or, what was the result? It said these guys were going to be cut off from the congregation. That's quite a statement. You don't hear too many people preach the gospel talking about getting cut off, but this is, this is the gospel, this is the truth. We cannot walk in the ways of sin any longer. Say, well, how can that be? Well, Romans chapter 6, verse 11 says this, Likewise reckon you also yourselves to be dead indeed into sin. You're dead into sin. But alive into God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Dead into sin. Does that mean I can't sin? No. That means that something is dead into sin, but it doesn't mean that you can't sin. Some people have thought it's dead into sin, that means we don't sin anymore. Eh, that's a lie. You are made of three parts, spirit, soul, and body. What got changed? Your spirit. You got a brand new spirit on the inside of you. The spirit of Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit comes and dwells in your spirit. Does your spirit sin? No. Where are you dead to sin? In spirit. Where else, though, uh, what else are you made of? Soul and body. Could you sin in your soul? Yes, you can, by choosing to do things contrary to God's word. How about your body? Well, your body's a problem because sin is dwelling in the flesh. And if you walk by being dick the dictates and the lusts and the desires of the body, you're going to walk in sin continually. Now, he says you're dead into sin, but live unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So where does that talk about I'm going to be living from now? I'm not going to live from my body any longer because sin dwells in it. And I'm not going to be living from my soul, just about whatever I want to do, my mind, will, and emotions, just my thoughts. I'm going to be living from my spirit. Because your spirit is the brand new you on the inside of you. We're going to walk according to the spirit. We're going to live from our spirit. Verse 12. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body that you should obey it in the lust thereof. Now you say, well, I still have this body. What am I supposed to do about that? Well, your body has all these lusts. And you are not going to let your body run you. Notice. Let not sin reign in your mortal body. It could reign in your body if you give place to it and allow your body to run you. How would it reign? You have to obey it. If you don't obey the lusts that come from the body, then you will not sin. We cannot walk by the body any longer. That brings us to another point. We'll come back in a moment. In Romans, what are we supposed to do with our body then? Verse 1, I beseech you therefore, brethren, Romans 12, 1, by the mercies of God that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, that's your reasonable service. Your body is to be presented as holy and a living sacrifice, even though it has sin in it. Otherwise, you're going to make your body be presented to the things of God as you're walking by the Spirit, you're not going to be letting your body do whatever it wants to do. You see, there's a problem in our body. Romans chapter 7, we see this brought out. In Romans 7, 24, this is where Paul said, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? Your body is a body of death. It has no life in it. What is the life? It's the spirit. What happens when a person dies? Their spirit leaves their body, doesn't it? Is their body alive any longer? No, it's dead. So what is the real life? It's the spirit. So we have a body of death. 
At the same time, you are to present your body as a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto him. Well, how do I stop from being run by this body of death with its lusts and its desires? That would cause me to walk in sin if I obey it. Well, verse 25 says, I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Through Jesus, you can do this. How? How? So then with the mind, I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. So the key is your mindset. If your mind is knowing the law of God, renewed to the law of God, walking in law, thinking on what the, what the word of God says, which is the law of God, then you'll serve God and you won't sin. But if you're operating according to the flesh, and what's the voice of the flesh? My feelings, things that I feel like I want to do or from a carnal-minded, which is a mind controlled by the flesh, not considering what the Word says, just doing whatever I th would like to do, whatever I feel like doing, whatever I think, from my human desire standpoint. If I walk by that, I will end up serving the law of sin, and I will be in bondage. God does not want that. So we go back to Romans 6, and we see that we don't have to obey this any longer. We don't have to obey the loss of the body. We can now get our mind renewed to the Word, and with our mind we can serve the Word of God, the law of God. Another thing that's important is you have all these members of your body. Neither yield your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin. What are your members? What you hear? what you put your hands to, what you see, what you think upon, what you speak with this tongue, or steps that you take with your, your feet, those are all your members. Your members are under your control of what you yield to. Neither yield you your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin. Otherwise, I could yield myself to hear things that are unrighteous that aren't in line with God's Word, it'll produce sin. I could yield my mouth to speak words that are unrighteous, that are not in line with God's Word, it's going to produce sin. I could be looking at things that, oh, that's not righteous, that's going to cause me to sin. I can be putting my hands to things or walking the steps, yielding my members in any capacity. So I now have to make sure that I'm yielding my members to the right thing. Yield yourselves unto God. You see, you have a will. And you can choose to yield what you hear, what you see, what you think upon, what you speak, what you put your hands to, and the steps that you walk in. You can choose what you're going to yield it to. Yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead. That's right. I'm going to yield my members as one who is alive from the dead spiritually, born from above. I have a relationship with God. I'm now going to yield to His ways and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. How am I going to know what is righteous? It is the word of righteousness. God's word is the word of righteousness that we get our mind renewed to. We'll come back to this for a moment. What's the next thing we need to do after we present our body? Verse 2 where we said, be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. If you're going to fulfill unleavened bread, which is no more sin, these things are essential, practically applicable for you in your life. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. You're going to be changed. And this transform is a word metamorpho. This is where we get the... the word metamorphosis from, and if you remember from science class, metamorphosis is the process where the caterpillar is changed into a butterfly. That is a change in species. Metamorphosis for you is you're going to be changed from a worldly-minded, carnal-minded, fleshly-minded, human-being-minded person into a spiritually-minded, heavenly-minded, 
word-ruled-minded person, you're going to now have your mind renewed. And it's going to be absolutely, completely changed and renovated. Absolute change. Therefore, if you are going to conquer sin, which we are to do, we got to get our mind renewed. So we go back to Romans, where we talked about in verse 13 about not yielding our members. Then in verse 14 he says, For sin shall not have dominion over you. It's not supposed to rule over you any longer. That's all part of the application of unleavened bread, because we're not going to touch anything that's leavened any longer, anything that's sinful. And he says, Sin shall not have dominion over you. Why? For you're not under the law, but under grace. What does that mean? You're not under the Old Testament. That's what it's talking about when it refers to the law. That was a law of sin and death that just brought the knowledge of sin, that brought, showed them the fact that they had sin in their life. It was a schoolmaster until Christ came. Couldn't get him free. But now we're under grace, which is the favor of God through Jesus Christ. We now have been born again. We are not under Satan's authority. We're not under the, under the dominion of sin any longer. We are dead to sin. Now we can live unto God. We come to verse 16. Know ye not to whom you yield yourselves servants to obey. Now we talked about yielding your members, all your faculties, but it's more than just yielding your members to something what I might see, or a thought, or a words, or what. This now brings something else out. When you yield yourself, you're yielding to a whom. That's a spiritual authority over you. That's a person. You're either yielding to God, or you're yielding to the devil. Right. It's one or the other. Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm just yielding to myself. No, you're not yielding to yourself. That's the big lie. You're not in control as far as the authority over you of what you're yielding to. Because if you yield to God's word, you're yielding to God and you're walking his ways. If you don't, you'll walk in sin, which is yielding to the devil, and you'll walk in the devil's ways, which will take you down a path of destruction. Notice, he said, know ye not to whom a person you yield yourself servants to obey. You actually become a servant. That means you could be born again, and yet you could be a servant of the devil by yielding yourself to do what's wrong. His servants you are to whom you obey. Of sin, whether of sin, committing sin, what does that produce? Death. Remember he said, hey, if you're going to eat this leaven, you're going to be cut off. Well, that's death. Or of obedience unto righteousness. So, you and I need to make sure that we're obedient. Obedient to the word that produces righteousness, not obedient to the lusts of the flesh. It comes down to what you obey. If you will obey God's word, then you're going to have eternal life. You're going to see God's blessings come forth in you. You're going to be obedient unto righteousness. God be thanked you were the servants of sin. That's the way we were before we were born again, because we were under Satan's dominion. But now you've obeyed from the heart the form of doctrine that was delivered to you. That meant we received Jesus, the doctrine, the teaching that came. We received Jesus from our heart. We got born again. Being then made free from sin, you are free from sin. You must know that and you must believe that. Where am I free from sin? Not in my body. It's sin's dwelling in it. Not in my mind unless it gets renewed to the law of God, the word of God. See, if you have a carnal mind, you'll walk in sin. Made free from sin, where? In spirit. You became servants of righteousness, because how are you going to live? You're going to live by your spirit. You're going to walk in the spirit. You're not going to walk according to the flesh or your will, intellect, and emotions of the soul realm without considering submitting it to the spirit. You do have a will. It's got to choose to yield to something. He goes on and says, I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh as you yield your members' servants to uncleanness and to iniquity, which is lawlessness. 
unto more lawlessness, it's the word onomia, even so now yield your members, all your faculties, servants. That tells you something else. Your members are actually servants. They're your servants. What are you going to let your servants be yielded to? Are you going to yield it to the devil, to sin? Which means you become, a, you become actually a servant of the devil? Or are you going to yield your members' servants to righteousness? And what does that produce? Holiness. Produces the holiness of God in your life. And we come down to verse 22. Being made free from sin, which we are, become servants to God, which we are, you have your fruit. What kind of fruit? Fruits of righteousness that produces what? Holiness. And what's going to be the end result of all that? Everlasting life. That's why the Bible says, without holiness, no man shall see the Lord. He's not going to have eternal life. He's not going to have everlasting life. Leaven has got to be eliminated. All sin has to be eliminated out of our life. Well, then, how do I live now? Matthew chapter 4, verse 4 says, He answered and said, It's written, Man shall not live by bread alone, physical food, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God, spiritual food. We're going to live by God's word, which is spiritual law. That's how we're going to live. That's why the renewing of your mind to the word is absolutely essential in your life. What happens if you don't get your mind renewed to the truth? Your mind will be after the things of the flesh. Romans 8, 5, For they that are after the flesh, whatever I feel like doing, my human nature desires, my feelings, my attitudes, my thoughts, what I like to do. Do mind the things of the flesh, that's what you'll mind. But they that are after the Spirit, I mean, no, I want to walk after the Spirit now, the things of the Spirit. Otherwise, I'm not going to let the flesh dictate my life. I'm going to have the Spirit dictate what I'm going to do. To be carnally minded, that is one where the flesh has control of all it does. Desires, feelings, my thoughts, my desires, human, human nature way of doing things. It's death. But to be spiritually minded what is that? That's a mind that's renewed to the Word. I'm thinking on what the Word says. You see, we are now going to operate in the Spirit. We are now going to operate according to spiritual law, which is the judge of all things. What's that going to produce? That's going to produce life and peace. The carnal mind, a mind that's not submitted to God's Word, it's an enemy against God. Enmity or hostile to God, this really means. Enmity in the Greek, look at it, means being hostile unto God. We're resistant to Him. For it's not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So then they that are in the flesh, not walking in the Spirit, they cannot please God. They're in trouble. They're not going to be walking in the ways of the Word. Unleavened bread is about you and I conquering all sin in our life. And that's what he wants. No more leaven in our life. You know, the gospel has not been taught that way. If we all heard this from the very beginning, when we got born again, we wouldn't have made a lot of mistakes walking around on the flesh and the sin and the world and doing all the allowing these things to continually happen in our life, which has caused all kind of bondages. No, we, got, we would have got out of that. Another thing we mentioned that you and I are priests now. Exodus 29.1 talks about when they were to minister unto him in the priest's office. They would take a bullock and two rams without blemish. Unleavened bread, cakes unleavened tempered with oil, wafers unleavened anointed with oil, of wheat and flour thou shalt make them. Notice, unleavened, 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 which is all a type of no sin. We cannot have sin as a priest. Now you and I have become kings and priests unto God. And what are we to do? We are to walk in the Spirit, and we are not to walk according to sin. 
and we are to serve the Lord. And everything we're going to do is going to be in the spirit now, <laughs> spiritually, according to God's word. Look what it says in 1 Peter 2, 5. You also as lively stones. What is this about lively or living stones? Well, Jesus is the cornerstone of what? What's a cornerstone of? It's a cornerstone of a house, right? So what are we? We are living stones in the house. What kind of house? A spiritual house. Jesus is the cornerstone of the spiritual house of God that he is build, building. Every one of us are living stones, if you've been born again, in the house of God. And what is he doing? He's doing something because we've got to get strong and we've got to get developed in spiritually. And how's that happen? We've got to be built up. We've got to build the house. The house has to be built. When it says here, okodomio, building the house, this is a present tense verb, which means are being built up. You and I are being built up a spiritual house. You and I are a work in progress to build the spiritual house in our life. What's that produce? A holy priesthood. And what do we do? We offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. We do have sacrifices that we offer. Remember, in the New Testament now, that we're born again, everything we do will be in this realm of the Spirit according to spiritual law, not according to natural law any longer. You and I are a spiritual house. And what are we to do? Matthew chapter 7, verse 24. There, therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, I liken him to a wise man which built his house upon a rock. Now this is talking about how a guy builds his house. And this is talking about how you and I build our spiritual house. He talks about the guy who hears his sayings. Oh, that's the word, the word of righteousness. And are we supposed to just hear it once in a while? No. Continually hear it, present tense. The guy who is continually hearing his word and doeth, present tense, means continually doing it. That means the guy who is hearing and doing and hearing and doing and hearing and doing and hearing and doing. He's a wise man from God's standpoint because he's building his house, the spiritual house, on a rock. And if it's on a rock, it's going to be firm, it's going to be established, and nothing is going to knock that house down. It's going to be stable. It is going to be strong. Any attacks that come against it will not even be able to affect it whatsoever. The rain descended, floods came, winds blew, beat upon that house, that house that was built on the rock, fell not because it had been founded upon a rock. The foundation had been laid is what this means. It had been laid and established. But then in verse 26, everyone that heareth these sayings of mine, he's been hearing the word continually. Well, that's good. Uh, we got to hear the word in order to have our mind renewed to it. And doeth them not. He's not doing them. Otherwise, present tense again, not continually do them. He's just hearing them. But he's not doing them. What's this guy like? He's like to a foolish man who built his house upon the sand. Would you go build your house on sand? No. What's going to happen if you built your house on sand? The rain descended, the floods came, the winds blew, beat upon that house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. So if you're going to build your spiritual house so you do not walk in sin, so that you will be that holy priesthood, that priest that's going to walk in the ways of the Lord and not sin, then what are you going to do? You're going to hear and you're going to do the word consistently. That is what you do where you put the word of God first place. The priests were to eat unleavened food continually. What are you to eat? Unleavened word, the word of God continually is to come into you. And you are to be build up a spiritual house. What else do we see? 
You are to be separated. Live a separated life unto God. In Numbers chapter 6, it speaks about the vow of a Nazarite to separate themselves unto the Lord. The Nazarite was one who was to separate themselves to walk in the ways of holiness and to follow the way of the Lord. In verse 13, the law of the Nazarite. When the days of a separation were fulfilled, he's brought in the door of the tabernacle of the congregation, and he offers all his offerings up here, it says. And he also has this unleavened bread. He's got the wafers of unleavened bread, all this unleavened stuff, and brings in and offers his offering. What does that tell you also? The guy who's the Nazarite, who's separated unto the Lord, he's the one that has, is separated to him, and he is bringing, he's the one who has un, un, everything that's unleavened. Well, again, this is the fulfillment of unleavened bread in our life. You and I are to be separated unto God and separated from that which is not of the Lord. Romans, I mean, 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 17 says, Wherefore, come out from among them, talking about all the things that are of unbelief, unclean, lawless, not of the Lord, sinful, and be ye separate. The word separate is the word aphorizo in the Greek, which means to mark off from others by boundaries, to be separate. God wants us to mark off from boundaries and be separate from that which is not of the Lord. And touch not the unclean thing. We can't touch anything unclean. And I'll receive you. It's talking about spiritually unclean. You don't want anything that's unclean to come into you. You want to get rid of all of it. Leaven is that which is evil and which is sinful, which is unclean. We're to be absolutely separate from it. When we talk about this leaven as well, also we see over in Matthew, if we're going to be unleavened, we're going to live by the word, and we're going to make sure that we don't have anything that's contrary to the word in us. And it's interesting, in Matthew 6, verse 6, 16, verse 6, Jesus said to him, to his disciples, he said, take heed and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Yeah, that means something that's sinful, something that's the wrong thing, because they're supposed to be unleavened. We don't want anything that's of these guys. What was their problem? Down in verse 11, how is it that you do not understand that I spake not to you concerning bread? They thought he was talking about bread because they were thinking in the natural. That you should beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Then understood they how he bade them not beware of the leaven of bread, but of the doctrine of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. The teaching, the false teaching that was coming forth from them. And they were teaching all kinds of things that were false. They were hypocrites. They were teaching things that were contrary and also were hypocritical. Luke 12, verse 1. In the meantime, when they were gathered together an innumerable number of a multitude of people, insomuch that they strode one upon another, he began to say unto his disciples, first all of all, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. That means that's someone who says something, but does another. Now, we got some people running for office that are the same way, don't we? Say something and do another. They're liars. Don't you dare vote for them. They're hypocrites. Matthew 23, verse 3. Look what it says about these guys. He's talking about these guys, the Pharisees here. Scribes and Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. All therefore whatsoever they bid you observe, that observe and do, but do not after their works, for they say and do not. They say one thing and do another. Otherwise, they bring out, they pretend to be one thing, and then they turn out to be another. You can't be that kind of a Christian. You've got to be the real deal. You say something, you do it. We cannot be hypocritical. 
We can't act one way. You can't act one way around people and then in your home be a totally different person. <laughs> How are you at home? How are you around other people, you know? You need to be the same all the time. We cannot be hypocritical lives or we have leaven. These guys had false teachings and they had hypocrisy in what they were doing. And then we come down to the leaven of Corinth. These guys were really messed up. They had a lot of problems in Corinth. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 1. This is a church, remember, but they were not keeping things right. Verse 1, it's reported commonly that there's fornication among you, such fornication as is not so much as named among the Gentiles, that you should one should have his father's wife. That's incest. That's crazy. And you're puffed up and have not rather mourned that he had done this deed might be taken away from you. That's what should have happened. For verily I was absent in body, but present spirit have judged already as though I were present concerning him that hath so done this deed. You didn't deal with this, but I've judged this thing already because this is wrong and it has to be dealt with. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when you're gathered together in my spirit with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, to deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of the flesh. Otherwise, this guy can't be in the church. He's contaminating it. You've got to get him out. He's going to go, he's, he's already under Satan's dominion because he's yielding to him. So, you know, the destruction of the flesh is going to happen. Now, if he comes to repentance, he could be saved. When he says that the Spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord, that doesn't mean he's going to automatically be saved. Some people that believe the one saved always saved says, oh, that meant he still got saved even though he's an incest. Well, that's contrary to the rest of the scriptures that say fornicators don't enter into the kingdom of God and fornicators and, and whoremongers enter in the lake of fire. The scripture is not broken. It does not contradict itself. When it says that the Spirit may be saved, that's a conditional statement. How do you know? Because it's a subjunctive mood verb. That's why I always look these things up and show these things to you. That means that subjunctive mood means conditional statement. Otherwise, the Spirit may be saved if conditions are met in the day of the Lord Jesus. Which, what condition would that be? You'd obviously have to confess a sin, repent, and get out of that, and get right. And he could be forgiven of that sin. But if not, he would end up being destroyed. Then he says, your glory is not good. Know ye not that a little leaven, what's leaven? Sin. Leavens the whole lump. What's the whole lump? The church. That means sin in the camp contaminates the whole group. That's why you can't allow that. Could these guys, should they have been allowing fornication to go on? No. What's going to happen to all these churches throughout the world, and there's a whole lot of them, that turn their eyes and just kind of ignore when people are in fornication, walking in all these, you know, kind of evil ways and so forth? Oh. You need to stand up and correct them and tell them what they need to do. Get, bring them to the help, help them come to the place of repentance because it's contaminating the whole group. Purge out, therefore, the old leaven, as you may mean in new lump, as you're unleavened. So who, what are you and I? You and I are unleavened. We're not to have sin in our life. The practical application is God wants you to conquer all sin in your life. And it's going to be a work in progress as you learn and you grow in the things of God and overcome. God understands that, of course. But at the same time, you can't decide, I'm just going to abide in areas of sin. You're going to be leavened then. For even Christ, our Passover, sacrificed for us. He says, let us keep the feast. Now, this is where it's talking about the personal application in our life. How do we keep the feast in a personal way? Because the church was supposed to keep the feast not in a religious way, but in a practical application way. Not with the old leaven, with the leaven of malice and wickedness. Now you can't, you can't be keeping this feast where you're supposed to be holy and unleavened by having a bunch of wickedness and all this evil in you. No, that doesn't work. But with the unleavened bread of sincerity, this means purity, means purity and truth. Otherwise, we've got to get pure, we've got to walk in the truth. That's how you're going to keep this applicable in your own life because you're going to walk free from sin.
You're going to walk in truth. You're going to walk in purity. I wrote into epistle not the company. This means to keep company with fornicators. Yet all not, not all together with the fornicators of this world, or the covetous, or extortioners, or with idolaters, then must you needs, me needs go out of the world. But now I've written unto you not to keep company, if any man's called a brother be a fornicator. And see, they say, hey, you can't have fornicators in the church, or covetous, or idolater, or railer, or drunkard, or extortioner. Well, no, it's such a one you don't even eat, because they're leaven. They're contaminated. God does not want that. What have I to do to judge them also without? Do you not judge them without? Hey, we're supposed to, if we would judge ourselves and turn away from these things, that's what, of course, we need to do. At the same time, we can't have those things going on in our lives whatsoever. That's leaven. It is to be rooted out of our light. In fact, these guys had all kinds of problems in Corinth. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 20. I fear lest when I come I shall not find you such as I would, but that I shall be found unto you such as, as I would not. Although I don't want to find you this way. There's debates, contention and strife, envyings, wrath, strifes, which is them trying to get ahead of someone else, electionary, partisan, you know, cliques and all this kind of stuff. Backbitings, whisperings, swellings, tumults, instability, confusion, all this stuff going on. Unless when I come again, my God will humble me among you, that I shall bewail many which have sinned already and have not repented of the uncleanness, fornication, lasciviousness which they've committed. They were messed up. He says, look, you guys got to straighten this thing out. God wants the church to be holy, unleavened. The practical, personal fulfillment and application is clean up in all areas of life and get rid of it all. Get rid of all of this sin. You know, we got these great promises. 2 Corinthians 7, 1, he did tell these guys what to do. He said, 2 Corinthians 7, 1, he says, look, you guys, you've got all these great promises that are already yours. All the promises are yea and in and amen. In fact, he even told them that way back in chapter 1, verse 20 where he said, all the promises of God in him are yea and amen. Hey, you can possess every promise in your life. You should be possessing all these. So he says, having all these promises, dearly beloved, let's do something about it. Let's cleanse ourselves and get all this filthiness out of us so we possess the promises. Let's cleanse ourselves from all the filthiness of the flesh. Every fleshly work, get rid of it. If it's not in line with the word of God, get rid of it. And spirit, what's that? Filthiness of the spirit. I, well, I thought our spirit was fine. Our spirit is fine. What's the filthiness of the spirit? All the evil spirits that are in us. That's where deliverance comes in. Deliverance is important to cast out all the evil spirits, the filthy spirits, unclean spirits, to get it out of us. And what's that going to do? Perfect holiness in the fear of God. It's going to be perfected in our life. And what kind of a church is Jesus going to present to himself? One that's holy, without blemish. So what does this tell you? Churches, individuals that are not cleansing themselves with the filthiness of the flesh and all the evil spirits by casting them out to possess the promises will never, if they're not doing this, perfect holiness in the fear of God. It means they are in trouble. Think of all the churches out there that don't do deliverance and casting out evil spirits. <laughs> they're sunk. They're in trouble because they're not doing what the Word says. That's why we do what we do. And we will always have deliverance and always have deliverance cast out sessions available always and have our cast out everything because we got to get set free. Not only to get rid of the works of the flesh, but we got to get rid of all these evil spirits because we can't have any leaven in our lives. We want to perfect holiness and the fear of God so we're ready for the coming of the Lord. That's what he wants. Another area of leaven we need to talk about for a moment. And this is another one that's affected the body of Christ. Oh, they've made a lot of mistakes and they continue to make mistakes out there in the body of Christ. It's amazing. They go back into the Old Testament law. 
They talk about the Hebrew roots of all these things. We are not under the Old Testament law any longer. We're under the New Testament law. The covenant has changed. The law has changed. It's not an add-on. It's not a continuation. It is a brand new covenant. It has changed. Galatians chapter 5, verse 1. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ has made us free. That's right, in the New Testament. And be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. What's the yoke of bondage? That was the Old Testament law. It was a yoke of bondage. It could never produce liberty whatsoever. It was that which brought condemnation upon them. It was all about condemnation. Brought the knowledge of sin, condemned them because they had sin. It never could bring forth freedom. You had to get born again first. And you had to come out from being dead to sin before you could conquer it. They were never dead to sin in the Old Testament. They were under the law. They didn't have the spirit of Jesus Christ. They were bound by sin. They were in bondage to it. So, how can we go back into bondage? We can't, unless we're not wise. Behold, Paul, I, I, Paul, say unto you, if you be circumcised, that's what they did in the Old Testament, Christ shall profit you nothing. It doesn't do you any good anymore. I testify again to every man that's circumcised that it is, he is a debtor to do the whole law. Christ has become of no effect from you because whoever, whosoever you are justified by the law, thinking, keeping the Old Testament. And we have a lot of people out there in the body of Christ that think we're supposed to go back and keep the Old Testament law. In fact, they even focus on the Old Testament law, which is the word means Torah, and they focus on studying the Old Testament law. <laughs> they think they're going to be justified by the law. It's not going to happen. It says, you're fallen from grace. Guess what? You left the way of the New Testament. Because the grace is what brought, it was for the New Testament, Jesus brought grace. We through the Spirit wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. That's what we do. We're in Christ, Jesus Christ, neither circumcision availeth anything nor uncircumcision, but faith which worketh by love. You did run well. They were walking the right walk. Who did hinder you that you should not obey the truth? Which was the word of God that Jesus brought. They quit obeying the truth. They start going back into the Old Testament law ways again. This persuasion cometh not of him that calleth you. It didn't come from the Lord. It came from men who were deceived by the devil with doctrines of devils. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. Ah, A little bit of this going back into the law, which is falling from grace, which is now bringing you back into bondage, because you're walking after the ways of of the law, which never could bring you out of it. It leavens, contaminates the whole lump. We see that statement again. So here these guys went right back into bondage. And now he comes up to verse 16 and he's saying, look, this is the way you're supposed to walk. This I say then, walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. That's what God wants. He wants us to walk in the spirit. The flesh lusts against the spirit, the spirit against the flesh. They're contrary one to another. And then he comes along here in verse 19, and he begins to talk about the works of the flesh. That would be inconsistent of considering the works of the spirit, which is walking after God's word. And he talks about how these things are manifest. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, that's unbridled lust, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, contentions and strife, as we're talking about, emulations, this is punitive zeal, getting back at people, wrath, passion, angry, having anger, attitudes, outbursts at people, strife, again, this is this partisan fraction spirit trying to be better than another, seditions, divisions, dissensions, that shouldn't happen, heresies, People be believing things that are contrary to the word and taking heretical beliefs. We see lots of them out there. It's astounding, the heresies that are out there. Envies, murders, drunkenness, intoxication. This should not happen. Revelings, the party spirit, the carousing spirit, and such like. That's what the world does. 
And of this which I tell you before, as I've also told you in time past, those which do such things or practice such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. What does God say? Get rid of all the leaven out of your life. Because that's the practical application of the feast of the Lord. Because did Jesus pay the price for sin? You better believe he did. Does sin have no dominion over you? It's right. Sin has no dominion over you. If you yield to sin, you're yielding to the devil. A whom? Well, I don't want to be letting the devil run my life. It's exactly what we'd be doing. How can we let the devil run our life if God has already set us free from the devil, brought us out of the authority of darkness, brought us into the kingdom, brought us to be priests before God, brought us to the place where sin has no dominion? That's what God wants, see. Instead, he wants the fruit of the Spirit to come into your life. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, and against such there's no law. Those that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and the lust thereof. What is going to be the answer? You belong to Jesus Christ, you're born again. You are to crucify, put to death, all the affections and lusts of the flesh. They're all to be put down. If we live in the Spirit, which we do because we have a brand new Spirit now, we got the Holy Spirit, we just receive Him, He's dwelling us. Let us also walk, this means to proceed in a row like the march of a soldier. <laughs> Let's direct our life like a soldier, He's do, obey, obeying, walking after the laws or the, the, the things that are set for Him of what He's supposed to do in the Spirit. That's how we're going to walk. This is why also, when we come over here to Luke chapter 9, what did Jesus say to these guys that wanted to come after him? He said to them all, and he would say to all of us, if any, the word man's not there, it means any or whosoever, will, this is the main verb in the sentence, come is actually, it's not, will's not a helper verb for come, like will come in our language. The word come is an infinitive in the Greek. The way you would translate this, like Young's brings it out, will to come. If any man or whosoever wills to come after me. Hey, I set my will. I want to follow after Jesus. What's the first thing he's supposed to do? Deny himself. Why? Because he can't walk after his own ways any longer because he's going to walk after heaven's ways. He's got to learn heaven's ways. If you walk after yourself and you don't deny yourself and do what you want, you got leaven. Are we fulfilling the personal fulfillment of the feast? We're not even getting past the first step after getting born again. We're hung up in leaven land, sin land. We're in trouble. We're not going to go anywhere. And take up his cross daily. That's the crucifying of the flesh, isn't it? Daily. And follow me. How do we follow Jesus? He's the Word. Follow the Word, we do the Word. We walk in line with the Word of God. That's what God wants. Deny yourself, crucify the flesh daily, follow after me. And what about our soul realm? We don't let our soul realm run us. Whosoever shall save or keep safe and sound and rescue, have it protected, his Life. What kind of life? This is the word suke, which means soul. The suke, soul life. life. Otherwise, if I'm trying to keep my own soul realm life safe, I'm going to lose it. I'm going to destroy it. Because that means I'm walking according to my ways. But whosoever will lose or destroy or Put out of the way entirely. It's probably a good way to answer. This is a good definition of this in this context. Put, out, put this soul realm, lose his soul realm directed life. This is soul realm. Put out of the way entirely his soul realm life. Get this out of the way. For my sake, the same will save it. What does that mean? That means you don't walk after your soul. You walk after your spirit. How can I have my soul with my mind and my will that I choose, walk after the Spirit. My mind gets renewed to the spiritual ways, and then I submit my mind and my will to do what the Spirit wants. 
at all times. If I do that, I'll be fine. 1 Corinthians chapter 9. One last set of scriptures. Verse 24, Know ye not that they which run in a race run all in one and receives the prize. We want to get the prize. The prize of eternal life. So run that you may obtain, you may lay hold upon this. You do have to run this race, see. Every man that strives for the mastery, which is what we're doing, while we're contending with adversaries, striving for the mastery, contending with adversaries, because we've got to deal with the adversaries, the devil and the flesh, and the world, is temperate in all things. He's got to be self-controlled. That means the flesh has got to be put underfoot. They do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. I therefore so run, not as uncertainly, I know where I'm heading. I'm heading towards what God has for me. So fight I, not as one that beats the air, because I'm fighting something too. What am I fighting? A spiritual fight against a spiritual enemy. I'm not beating the air. I know I'm hitting the mark against the devil. But I keep under, this means to like, Handle it, discipline, discipline it like a boxer buffets his body. I discipline this body, and I bring it into subjection. I lead it away to be my slave, lest by any means, when I preach to others, I myself could be not approved. Paul says, hey, if I don't do this, I'm not going to be approved. I'm going to be sunk myself. Therefore, we're going to get rid of all the leaven. How are we going to conquer the personal fulfillment of the Feast of Unleavened Bread is we're going to get rid of all areas of sin, all the uncleanness. We're going to crucify the flesh daily. We're not going to yield our members into anything that's not right. We're going to make sure that we're walking according to the New Testament law. We're not going to follow back into the lying teaching of the Old Testament law. We're not going to follow after the lusts of the flesh and get into fornication or any of this kind of stuff that's all wrong. We're not going to walk in you know, any of these ways that are contrary, any things of the flesh. We're not going to be run by our soul. We're going to be walking by the Spirit. We're not going to have any leaven in us because it'll contaminate us. That's why it says, you know, if you've got, some, you got a little bit of darkness in you, your whole body's dark. Wait a minute, I've got a little bit. How did that make me a whole thing? Because it contaminates the whole thing. That's why you got to keep it out. We can't let any darkness come in. This is why there's only going to be a few that are going to be saved. It's very sad. We will fin We said the last scripture. We got to go one more. Romans seven, Matthew seven, verse thirteen and fourteen. Look what it says: Enter you in at the straight gate, the narrow gate. Unleavened is the narrow gate. Wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction. Uh, oh, all over the place, there's all kinds of gates to go to destruction. Many there be that go in there at. That's trouble. That's a whole lot of people. Narrow, the straight means narrow in the Greek, stenos. Narrow is the gate. And when it says narrow here, it's the word thibo, which means pressed. Pressed is the way that leads to life. It is a narrow way. And few there be that find it. We don't want to be one of the many. We've got to be one of the few. A little leaven contaminates you. What is God wanting for the personal fulfillment of the feast of the Lord in our life? And it's important. We receive Jesus, we ate the lamb. Now, we are leaving the world. We're through with it. We're out of Egypt. We're now walking according to heaven's ways. All the leaven is getting out of our life. We're only going to eat unleavened things, holy things, righteous things. We're going to get rid of all this stuff. We're separating ourselves. We don't touch the unclean thing anymore. We're priests unto God. We're building our spiritual house. We're watching God do things. We're getting cleansed of all the filthiness of the flesh and casting out all the demons. We're possessing the promises of God. We're walking in His ways. We're not going to be hypocrites, say one thing and do another thing. We're not going to be compromisers. 
We're not going to be fornicators or any of this kind of stuff. Works of the flesh. And we're not about to be deceived to think that we can go back in the Old Testament ways of the flesh and think that we're going to get anywhere. No, we're going to walk in the Spirit by the New Testament ways, and we're going to walk the straight and narrow path that leads to life. That is unleavened bread. We're going to apply it in our life, and we're going to walk in victory. Say this, Heavenly Father, I thank you and praise you for what Jesus has accomplished. And I have experienced Passover by eating the lamb, receiving Jesus as Lord and Savior. I am born again. I have the Spirit of Jesus Christ. I am now unleavened. I'm dead to sin. I will not allow any leaven in my life. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. Contaminates me. I cannot be contaminated. I will set myself. Set the boundaries. Mark off by boundaries. I will not touch the unclean thing. I will separate myself from that which is not of you. I will not be a compromiser. I will not have false doctrine. I'll make sure everything's in line with the Word of God. I won't be a hypocrite. I won't be walking in the ways of the flesh. I set my will that I will walk after the Word in the way of the Spirit. And I will be one of the few that's walking the straight and narrow way that leads to life. I will keep the feast of unleavened bread by walking in purity and in truth according to the word of God. Thank you, Lord. I am fulfilling the feast of the Lord in my life. In Jesus' name, amen. Tonight we're going to continue. We're going to talk about first fruits and go on from there and see the application of that in our life. When you, we get through all this, if you, don't, you can't hear it all, you can pick it up on the internet or, or by the tape, CD or DVD, you're going to see the picture of the work of Jesus Christ in you to bring you to the place of being like Him, the place of perfection, the place of holiness, the place of being everything that He wants for us to be. You'll see it all as we go through this. Praise God. Father, I thank you for all you brought forth. Thank you for the personal application of the feast of the Lord in our life. We will be hearers and doers of the word and see these things come to pass. We thank you for your great work that you're accomplishing in us. We give you praise and glory for it in Jesus' name.